he was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole sign, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley. The answer to both names, it was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with bats and looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle, no children. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I am sure. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time about paying bills without money? Finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who walks about with a Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stick of holly through his heart. Uncle! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone then. What good may it do to you? What good has it ever done? There are many things from which I have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep Christmas by losing your situation. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come. Dine with us tomorrow. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can we not be friends? Good afternoon. And a happy new year. Good afternoon. And letting Scrooge's nephew out, Mr. Cratchit had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Do I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is desirable that we should provide some slight provision to the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. Still, I wish I could say they were not. Under the impression that they scarcely furnished Christian cheer of mind or body to the multitude, few of us are endeavoring to get together a fund to provide the poor some means of warmth and cheer. Uh, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. I do not make myself merry at Christmas, and I cannot help to make idle people merry either. I work to support the establishments I have mentioned, and they cost enough. If, they, if you are badly off, you must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Well, I... Good afternoon, then. Yes, quite. Good afternoon. Bah, humbug. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think myself ill-used. 
and I'll be bound. And yet when I pay a full day's wages, you still think me ill you. It's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. A poor excuse for picking a man's spot every 25th of December, but I suppose we must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Yes, Mrs. Scrooge. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge snuffed out the candle, put on his top hat and cloak, and exited the counting house. He took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. A cold winter wind blew up from the east as Scrooge walked through the dark and damp, duskless environment and past the graveyard. The fog and frost so hung about the old black gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation on the threshold. a bit of cheese, some moldy bread, some undigested beef, that's all. Scrooge! Scrooge! It's humble, I won't believe it. Scrooge! Scrooge! Who? Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you, then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You don't believe in me? Mercy, dreadful apparition. Why, why do you trouble me? Do you believe in me or not? I do, I must. By what do spirits walk the earth and what do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Oh. You're chained. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Oh, Jacob. Or, would you know, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me! In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. At this time of year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and ever raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes in which its lie would have conducted me? Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me, Jacob. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. It's but the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over with? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. <laughs>